What if we told you that mental well-being is not the opposite of mental illness? Mental well-being, also known as flourishing, includes our emotional, psychological, and social well-being, which influences how we think, feel, and act. The goal of flourishing is not the absence of mental illness, but rather to provide you with the tools you need on your life journey. Welcome to Normalize the Conversation. I'm your host, Francesca Reigeter, and today I'm joined by the flourishing doc, Dr. Mike Neuhaus. Join us as we break down mental well-being into flourishing and languishing and offer tips on how you can flourish. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am really excited for our conversation. Before we begin, I just want to check in with you. How are you really? Hi, friend. Thank you so much for having me on your show. And thank you for that question. I appreciate that. I am well. I feel like I've just gone through a little bit of a roller coaster. You know, when some days you just think nothing's working, I've lost my vision for what to do next on my journey, what to aim for and so forth. And you almost consider giving up. And then the next day, all of a sudden, three good things happen at once. And you're reminded that most of success just comes down to grit. So I feel like over the last week, I've just gone through that. (laughs) And so today I'm well. And it's good to get that reminder just to be gritty and stick to it. Yeah, oh, I love that. I mean, that really resonates with what I've been going through lately. I have these days where I'm just like literally crying. I'm like, nothing's working out. I'm not getting anywhere. Why am I doing this? Just like questioning everything. And then the next day, things that I've been waiting for suddenly are starting to come in and are working. And I'm like, okay, it's not as bad as it is in my head. I am getting so stressed out about chasing this idea of, when I get this, then I'll finally be happy and things will look good and things will be good. And I'm kind of like chasing all these ideas. And then when it doesn't come right away, don't have that instant gratification. I'm like, I'm done just crying. It's something that I, I definitely need to work on. Yeah, absolutely. Me too. And I think it's also a good reminder that, I mean, while I have those phases and in my head, I just chuck a tantrum and I want to throw the towel and I want to give up. I still usually take some kind of steps forward, but they might not be, you know, the perfect action steps that where I come out with something really productive and amazing, but even just asking myself questions, like maybe what can I let go of or where do I need to shift what do I really need right now do I just need to let it all go and just look after myself for a little while so sometimes I need to remind myself that even those tiny steps that don't even feel like much are a lot in those moments and they will still bring you forward but it's also a reminder I think that sometimes some things come down to a little bit of circumstance and a little bit of luck and I kind of as a behavioral scientist I hate saying that because I'm all about math maximizing all the things we can do to increase our own locus of control (laughs) and our own influence on our own life and so forth. But um, some things are a matter of time and luck and coincidence or whatever you want to call it. So it's good sometimes to give, you know, the universe, I want to say a rest to catch up, uh, um, a chance to catch up and, and do its work as well, I think. Absolutely. It does come down to timing. Sometimes it's just not the right time. Sometimes something Mm. else needs to happen so you can grow into being ready for that opportunity. Sometimes things just don't happen because they're not to, and that's okay. But I think it's so also so easy to be so caught up in this idea that everything needs to happen right now. So then when it doesn't, it's like something's wrong with me and internalizing it, all these like overwhelming thoughts. And it's so easy to just shut down in that. I love what you said about asking yourself those questions because Mm. that's something that I started doing very recently. But up until that point, I was just like getting shut down and I was like, this is it. I can't do anything. And I would just sit and turn on Netflix. And I'm like, I just need to take time off, which it's so okay to take time off. But I was taking time off in an unhealthy way as a like, I give up, I'm done until something else does something for me. Exactly. And it's so interesting you say that because sometimes I think all we need to do is really take time off. And that means sometimes it just means also distracting ourselves. And sometimes watching Netflix can be absolutely healthy. If that is the only avenue for you in that moment, fantastic, just go for it. And I say that hoping that whoever is listening to it has a good amount of self-trust already, that they don't fall into that rabbit hole where they just binge, you know, with no end. Um And they don't keep an eye on themselves and dig themselves out of that hole again at some stage. So 
absolutely. Sometimes you just need to take that time off. And with regard to the questions you ask yourself, I, I it amuses me sometimes because I keep telling myself that when I am in those moments, I just really want to find the right answer. I want answers, but I realize afterwards that in those moments, I never ask the right questions. And it's all about, I need to just work on my questions and refining my questions. There's so much power in that, don't you think? There is asking the right questions and being honest with yourself with the answer. That was something I struggled with. I'm like, what do I need to let go of? I'm like, nothing. Or I'm like telling myself (laughs) that I need to let go of how I'm feeling about this when I know that maybe this person is hurting me. And I'm like, no, it's me and how I'm feeling and how I'm reacting. But there's a difference between I am overreacting to something or I am reacting out of something that's maybe being taken out of context or it is Mm -hmm. something that I need to work on. And then someone is actively being mean to me and I'm realizing that it's hurting me and I'm just crying about it and then blaming myself. So really being ready to be honest with what's impacting the way I'm thinking and the way I'm feeling because, you know, in this line of work, Things don't always happen right away. It's time. So much time. So It if, really does. So if I'm allowing myself to be surrounded by other things that are hurting me on top of this stress, it's I'm not going to get anywhere. I'm just going to continue to fall apart. And if I'm falling apart, I can't show up for myself or for anyone else in the way that I should. Absolutely. You cannot pour from an empty cup. And it, I love what you're saying about, you know, it starts with being honest to yourself. It really starts with self-awareness. And even there, it's often lacking, isn't it? I mean, I experience it. I think most of us experience it. It's that a lot of the things we perceive and we feel and we think they're not so clear cut. And being able to really tune into yourself and being able to understand what is really going on, because our emotions and feelings can be so complex we can feel hurt and frustrated and sad all at the same time and that can be hard to pick apart but as you said it starts with that honesty with yourself and a good level of self-awareness and then acceptance and validating those feelings you know and validating those feelings doesn't mean that you surrender to them you know it just means that you accept that you're just feeling what you're feeling right now if we don't do that we can't shift them those feelings. Absolutely. I mean, I love that because for so long, I think we're kind of taught to invalidate our feelings, right? From a young age, you're like, stop crying, get over it, don't act like a baby. All those things we tell kids, we are genuinely taught to invalidate ourselves and to tell ourselves to just get over it, let it go. So then as we get older and things are getting more difficult, a lot more is happening. And we're just constantly telling ourselves we need to let it go and get over it. And we're being dramatic, we're acting like a baby. We're never giving ourselves a chance to really feel, right? Or to understand what we're feeling and why we're feeling that way. Because maybe we're feeling that way because of something else that we actually can fix by setting a boundary, right? By showing up for ourselves, by adding in a self-care practice, by having a conversation and communicating. But if we're just constantly invalidating ourselves and never allowing ourselves to feel so that we can't explore it, figure out where it's coming from, accept it and move through it and have some kind of stepping like point forward, we're never going to be able to truly find who we want to be and get where we should get in life. Absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you. It's all about being able to be open to those feelings. And yeah, and as you said, you know, because only through that will we be able to shift whatever it is that we're struggling with in that moment. So it all comes down to that self-validation. And I think and I hope that um, that we're moving in the right direction as a society slowly, because I think it's slowly becoming more common knowledge that It's a myth that we always thought that if we're being hard on ourselves, then that raises our bar and it makes us achieve higher and more and so forth. Whereas now with all that self-compassion research coming out, you know, and Christine Neff doing an amazing job also popularizing it and spreading that knowledge. um, I think we're starting to realize that self-compassion will always win over self-criticism or you know being hard on yourself so we know from 
research that being compassionate towards yourself and even, you know, and self-compassion starts with mindful awareness of what we're perceiving in those moments. And then, you know, asking ourselves, well, what do I need right now? Meeting yourself with that self-kindness and also understanding this is a third element of self-compassion that we all go through this. It's not just me, 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 because that's the biggest difference between self-compassion and self-pity. Understanding that, no, we experience, we all experience these struggles in life. It's a normal part of the human experience. So I think we're starting to understand based on the research showing that self-compassion is really the key to achieving more, um, you know, shifting difficult emotions and making us realize, as you said, what is actually going on and how can I solve that? You know, do I need to set a boundary? Do I need to have that difficult chat, whatever it is? And it ends up being so much more productive, even though I hate using that word, but, you know, productive in all kinds of meanings, you know, bringing us forward, being constructive, maybe that's the better word to use. I mean, it is all part of the human experience. And mm. yet we're so quick to invalidate ourselves, to criticize ourselves, to beat down on ourselves. And it's heartbreaking because if only we took a minute and realized other people are going through this too, be compassionate towards others and ourselves so much could change like so mm. much could change in the way we all feel but going into that self-compassion I know for me when I first started hearing about self-compassion I thought okay anytime like I criticize myself or I have like this automatic negative thought like I'm just not compassionate toward myself at all and that like I must hate myself and I'm doing this wrong and it took a lot to realize that sometimes self-compassion is recognizing I had this negative thought let me reframe it or where is that coming mm -hmm. from how can I shift my mindset into believing in myself instead so I know just for me it was so hard to understand that criticism like self-criticism may still exist it may not be I don't know maybe people do completely get rid of it I haven't I wish I could and being aware that you can still sometimes accidentally be hard on yourself but you can still be compassionate by understanding where it's coming from and choosing to work on ways to shift your mindset so that you can love yourself absolutely I agree and I would say we all experience those negative thoughts towards ourselves and I think it's exactly what you're saying that you know it's similar to courage feel the fear and do it anyway, right? It, you know, being fearless doesn't mean not having or being courageous doesn't mean not have, perceiving any fear. And in a similar way, being self-compassionate doesn't mean that we love ourselves all the time and become our own best cheerleader, even in our thoughts. Most of us experience even things like intrusive thoughts, right? So just having what feels a little bit like uncontrollable thoughts or thoughts that might not even feel like they come from us or that we would proactively choose or anything like that so I think we all have that inner critic um, and it's exactly what you're saying it's it might not ever go away but we can learn techniques to tune down the volume and we can learn that we have a choice whether or not we want to buy into that inner critic or not whether we listen to it whether we believe what they're saying and we have control over what else we do, you know, how else we cultivate our mental well-being so that that inner critic almost gets a little bit disarmed. So there is a lot we can do, even though that inner critic might not always go away. And we do achieve that by practicing mindfulness. And I almost hate to say that because mindfulness is always hyped, but there's also a good reason for it. It's literally, you know, learning to gain back some of the control over our mind that we, we never really learned, right? Like we have to learn that. And we live in such a distracting world and environment with social media and so forth, where our attention is constantly torn into all kinds of places. And we need to learn tools to regain that control over our own mind so that we can decide, do I actually want to pay attention to this right now? And, you know, do I actually believe that? Is this actually a message that comes from what I truly believe in? Or is this just one of my old habits in the way that I speak to myself? Because once we learn that, once we learn to be more mindful towards our own thoughts, we then really have that choice to kind of just let them be. They can still be there. That's okay, but they won't do harm. So we do have a choice. And I have to say, this is something that's being drilled into my brain every day by some of my friends, because for so long, I'd be like, well, I just can't control the thought. 
I can't control it. I can't control intrusive thoughts. I can't make the suicidal ideation go away. I just, I can't do it. And I was convinced that I had no choice, that I was not in control of anything. And it took a lot of learning ways to just calm my mind and body for a moment so I can start to regain control. One thing someone um, has been making me do is like take a cold shower. Like right when those thoughts are getting really bad, like take a cold shower and let your like heart rate slow down for a second and then talk to yourself. Then like have a conversation with your mind. You'll have a lot more control than when you're like hearts racing really fast and you're overwhelmed and so much is happening. So finding small ways to have like a useful conversation with yourself, talk to yourself in a loving way. Where are these thoughts coming from? Why do I feel this way? Okay, maybe I'm reacting to something that I did actually create in my mind, a story that I told myself because someone said something or something didn't happen or maybe something with school. That's a big one for me. If I think I didn't do well on assignment, whew, bad. So learning that sometimes I am creating something in my mind and giving myself a chance to just listen to myself, calm down in the moment and actually regain control of how I'm feeling and start to shift yeah. that mindset because for so long I just thought I had no control and I would allow myself to fall apart and just surrender to the thought. Yeah. I love that you're saying that because you are not your thoughts. I think that's a very important lesson to learn for people. You know that these thoughts can just come from anywhere kind of thing and it doesn't mean that they're true. So first of all, you, you're not your thoughts, but also your thoughts aren't. I think that's where a lot of us stumble, I think. And, and understanding the many cognitive biases we have. So the, the many errors in thinking that, for example, even if we, you know, confirmation bias, if we believe something already, like I am not good enough, for example, our mind will go out of its way to find proof, you know? So we will automatically focus on all the things to kind of prove that idea to ourselves. So understanding that, um, I think, is really important. What I also loved about your story was that even though I hate the idea of cold baths or cold showers, <laughs> to be honest, but there's so much research behind that to say how good it actually is on so many levels, body and mind. I believe it's even quite effective to treat mood disorders. Um Using the body to move the mind, I think it's very clever because our bodies and our minds are absolutely intertwined. We can't, you know, tear them apart in any way. So sometimes if we feel like we get stuck in our thinking, it's a really good idea to move your body or do something with your body to change your physical state because that can often be a catalyst to changing your mental state as well so for me it's always going outside going for a nice long walk in nature if I can by the beach if I can honestly I do that for half an hour hour and I feel so much better for me it can also be you know talking things out and that doesn't necessarily mean talking to my friends or dumping all my <laughs> you know all the chaos I have in my mind because that can also be a burden to other people sometimes. Um, it's okay, you know, obviously, if you ask whether for consent, whether it's okay to share, I think sometimes we just forget about that. But talking things out. So what I often do is putting my own AirPods in, going for a walk and pretending to call myself. I know this sounds a bit crazy to many people, oh, but yeah. I swear it's my favorite form of therapy. Just pretending I give myself a call, asking myself, how am I? How am I really right now? What is going on? And honestly, I start talking and I talk things through. I talk through the chaos that is my mind in those moments. And I come out with so much clarity and I love it. So, but that's more to say, you know, use your body to move your mind, if that makes sense. Oh, it does. And that's something that I've been doing lately too. I love long walks. I sometimes do it late at night, which is probably not the safest thing to do. However, I'll walk like six miles. I'll walk to the beach and back and I'll put in my AirPods and I'll just like talk to myself in my mind and like I'll let myself vent it all out and just get all those like thoughts out. And then I'm like, okay, thoughts are out. Why do I feel this way? How much it's of so that good. is like true, right? Yeah. It changes everything. By the time I'm back, I'm like so happy and calm. I'm ready to listen to Taylor Swift again and not cry and then go to bed. Because if I don't walk before bed and all those thoughts are still active, so difficult to calm my mind and get the sleep that my body and mind need to function well tomorrow. 
you have a shower before you go to bed well your mind needs a bit of a shower too doesn't it and I love you know you said you know you just that venting is so good and I agree with that because you can vent but it doesn't hurt anyone and you don't talk badly about anyone in front of anyone so I think doing that on your own is the best way to do it yes and that's something that took me a long time to realize because I used to have to be on the phone with someone and like planning and yelling about it to someone and I'm like all I did was stress this person out. And sometimes I do need to talk to someone and I'll call them and be like, hey, can I talk to you about this? But sometimes I can really have that conversation with myself by myself because yeah. it's not fair to like get my friends worked up over something that I'm going to be over by the time the conversation's over and now they're stressed about it. Yeah. So sometimes it's just getting it out in some way, even if it's just with myself. Exactly. And venting by yourself doesn't mean that you're not going to have those important conversations if they need to be had. It just means that you have enough emotional intelligence to understand that in that moment, you need to digest a whole lot of you know emotions so that you can actually think clearly and show up in the conversation in a self-regulated state, which is so much more constructive, right? To actually come to consensus or have a good discussion with someone. So it's not to say that if you go vent by yourself that you shy away from having tough discussions if they need to be had. It's just a form of understanding what is going on for yourself and maybe working through some difficult emotions. Yes, oh, the venting to myself starts with, I don't like this person. They did this, this and this. And it ends with, I'm upset and I was hurt by this because I believed this and they were coming at it from a different angle. Now I can have a productive conversation because if I start with that initial, I don't like this person, <laughs> I'm done. I'm getting nowhere. I'm not connecting what's happening at all. And I just wasted like a solid 20 minutes complaining about someone who may maybe it was them, like maybe, but maybe it also was me, right? Being accountable for my part in it instead of just going straight to blaming someone else to everyone else, finding what I did and what I can change. Because maybe changing is setting a boundary. Maybe it's ending relationship, but maybe it's learning to communicate better. Maybe it's just learning that, okay, I need to take a deep breath while I'm talking to this person and think before I respond and react. There's so many yeah. things that could change if I just gain some awareness before reacting. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. It is so important. So with all this being said, <laughs> Let's talk about you and the work you're doing, The Flourishing Doc. Tell us about you. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, well, as you said, I'm the founder of The Flourishing Doc. Um, I'm a psychologist by trade, but I'm not clinically trained, so I don't work as a therapist. I've had some training, but I, I've never really worked um, as a therapist. I kind of specialized in organizational psychology and health psychology back then. I'm also a coach, and these days what I do is I work in the space where positive psychology and self-leadership overlap. So what I do is I help people and organizations understand what humans need to flourish or cultivate mental well-being so that they can realize their potential and create impacts that excite them. So both on an individual level and as on an organizational level. So I do that a lot through speaking, uh, through coaching, through, you know, lunch and learn sessions, providing training, education, that kind of stuff. And I absolutely love it. So when I say I help people understand what, what um, people need to flourish, what I mean is to cultivate mental well-being. And this is really important to understand because it's sort of set in the mental health arena. But usually when we think about mental health as a society, what we really mean is mental illness, right? If if I say mental health, what do you think about? Anxiety, depression, something like that, right? And treating it when it occurs and hopefully preventing it um, so it never occurs in the first place. But we know from research, especially the research that um, Professor Corey Keyes has done over the last two decades or longer, that Mental health is more than the absence of mental illness. We know that in order to be completely mentally healthy, we need two things. We need the absence of mental illness and we need the presence of mental well-being, which is a synonym for flourishing. We need both of those things. And 
I think Adam Grant probably popularized the term, well, not flourishing, but the opposite of flourishing, so that the lack or a low level of well-being during the COVID-19 pandemic, because he wrote this article for the New York Times about, you know, feeling me. Um, and so that is the perfect description of languishing or having low mental well-being when we don't have a mental illness, but we also don't feel like we're thriving in life. So, you know, when we feel blah or meh or like a living zombie, when we feel like we're, we're reliving Groundhog Day over and over again, when we feel like we're living on autopilot, we're functioning and we're operating in everyday life, but we don't really feel fulfilled. We don't feel like super motivated. We might be bored out of our brains kind of with life in general. That is what languishing is. So this is what we experience when we're not flourishing. And again, it's not a mental illness. It's a low level of mental well-being. And we know that it's so important for people to get out of that and to shift from languishing to flourishing because it's a key part of our mental health. And not only does it make us more likely when we're, when we're languishing to actually also develop a mental illness, but... If we have a mental illness and we learn to cultivate mental well-being or flourishing, we are much more likely to be able to um, overcome the mental illness a lot faster, a lot more successful as well. So it is super important. And flourishing is just absolutely awesome, Fran. And, and you know how mental health has this bad stigma and it's all about fighting the stigma. And I am so down for that. I think it's so important. I can't help but think sometimes that if only people knew what mental health also is, we wouldn't have to fight any stigma whatsoever because it is so cool. Mental well-being is all the things like feeling fully alive, feeling like you live your life with intention, perceiving meaning to your life, feeling like you're living your purpose, experiencing joy, feeling like you are deeply connected both with yourself and with other people, feeling like you can contribute to society. It's all the good things. Flourishing or mental well-being is so awesome. And so I'm on a mission to help people understand what we need to do to flourish. That is amazing. First of all, love languishing mm -hmm. because I think for so many of us, the idea of feeling like meh or like just we're not getting anywhere and we're like a zombie through life and we're just like getting through day by day but not really enjoying it. We associate that with depression, right? We associate mm -hmm. that with depression. And then we're like, okay, well, now something's wrong with me. I need to just snap out of this. And we kind of use all that stigmatizing language to then beat ourselves down more for it. If really we learn that maybe we need to find some intention. Maybe we need to work on loving ourselves more, on finding compassion, on figuring out what happiness means to us and chasing after that, just shifting small things that are huge things so that we're not just beating down on ourselves all the time and then kind of blaming something that's not there, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes total sense. And even, you know, you might think that you are depressed or something like that. I mean, many people would then actually hopefully take the step and get themselves checked out for depression, right? So what do you do? You go to your GP or, you know, as we say in Australia, your physician, your doctor, and um, you get tested maybe for it. But you might not score on all the criteria necessary to score and diagnose you with a depression. So you will leave your GP, of course, possibly somehow relief that you apparently don't have a depression, but you're left clueless and helpless nonetheless, because then what is wrong with me? You know, you're still, uh, now you're really stuck. And this is a big problem we have in our healthcare system at the moment, which is all focused on treating illness when it occurs, right? We're very reactive in our healthcare system and not preventive enough um, and proactive enough to help people understand what we can actually do to be really well. I mean, we're starting to understand that on a physical level uh, in, in the broader population, right? We all know we need to exercise, we need to eat well, doesn't mean that we're doing well at it. Um, but that's also an economic problem because there's so only so much you can do as an individual when you live in a system that bombards you with fast food outlets or whatever, right? sedentary lifestyle. Um, but we need to do a lot more to become more proactive with regard to our mental health and well-being. 
because there's a lot we can do and we can just start by educating. But of course, you know, it always takes a long time for research to be translated into our systems, you know. Um, some schools, for example, are starting to take up some, you know, classes or programs or workshop in positive psychology. So helping children understand what we need to be really well, you know, in our minds and so forth. But to, at this stage, it's really a privilege for the more, the wealthier private schools, because it costs a lot of money. There are not many people out there who are really schooled and skilled at providing these kinds of services to schools um, on a broad scale. But Absolutely. We, there's so much we can do if only we understood what we need to flourish. Because I, I do want to say, while well, happiness forms part of that, um, happiness is an interesting thing. And, and there's different forms of happiness. We can talk about that too in a second. Um, but I wouldn't call it chasing happiness because that is actually almost a little bit dangerous because happiness is not something we can chase. It is something that we can that will occur as a side effect or as a byproduct if we work towards flourishing flourishing really goes a lot deeper so it's a, a deeper form of happiness I don't know if you want me to say a little bit about those different types of happiness would that be interesting yes so it maybe please. makes a little bit more sense please. <laughs> excellent so one simple way to think about happiness is that we could distinguish at least two types of happiness because we have a little problem. When we talk about happiness, we think about being happy, cheery, right? And a lot of times people actually think that we need to be happy all the time, that we should aim to be happy all the time, like, you know, happy, cheery, and always be in a positive mood and always be smiling and always feeling positive and on top of the world and, you know, taking things on the bright side or seeing the bright side of life and stuff like that. And this is something we'd refer to as toxic um, positivity, as you would know. Um, because it's actually not very good. That's an absolute myth. You know, we need to experience a full array of emotions. That's just who we are. Emotions are just data. They help us navigate life in a constructive way and so forth. There is no way people can be happy all the time. So it's definitely not worth striving for. So this type of happiness, the feeling positive, laughing, you know, having a really good time, the, those moments of joy and pleasure, they're actually referred to as hedonic happiness. So, you know, that's maybe something people have heard before, hedonia, hedonic happiness. When it comes to flourishing, what is probably, of course, hedonic happiness or joy forms a part of that. But it, I would always say, let that come as a byproduct. The other form of happiness is referred to as eudaimonic happiness or eudaimonia. And that is that way deeper form of happiness. This is where you feel deeply fulfilled. That's where you feel like life has meaning. That's where you feel like you're accomplishing your goals in life and you are maybe mastering a skill you have and you are learning new skills and you are chasing your passions and so forth. And you feel deeply engaged with life. So that is eudaimonia. And you might already be able to see that sometimes in order to attain eudaimonic happiness, so that much deeper form of happiness, we actually have to sacrifice hedonia or hedonic happiness. So as an example, you know, if you go to uni and you want to study to become a lawyer, let's say, that takes many years of really hard work. And, you know, if you want to become a lawyer because it is your life's desire and, you, you know, definitely something you want because it aligns with your own values and passions and so forth, then it will automatically at some stage, it will provide you with a deep sense of meaning and happiness in that regard too, right? Eudaimonic happiness. But in order to attain that degree, there will be many days or many nights or many weekends where you will have to say no to having dinner with maybe friends or going out with your friends or going to a party you've been invited to or something like that. So you will actually have to sacrifice hedonic happiness in order to attain eudaimonic happiness. So those two parts, we sort of in positive psychology refer to them as um, emotional and psychological well-being form part of flourishing. And then there's also social well-being. So that feeling of being deeply connected with yourself and with others, but also to the society and feeling like you can contribute and give back. It is actually an innate human need we have to give back and feel like we can contribute in a meaningful way. So once we attain that, you know, we it will give us a deep sense of joy. 
It doesn't always mean that we're happy, cheery in every moment, because as, as I said, sometimes it just means having to sacrifice that hedonic happiness. Um, but it certainly eventually it, it'll come as a byproduct. And that's not to say that hedonic happiness isn't important. It certainly is important to get us through our day to day life and through the hardship. We spoke about this in the beginning. Sometimes everything goes wrong and we just question ourselves and we think, what the heck is going on? It's really good in those moments to find the small glimmers, you know, the small moments of joy or to proactively plan little snacks of joy throughout the day to get you through those tough times. So we do need that. But I would never chase for happiness per se. Okay, first of all, you just sold me mm -hmm. on my education because how many days and nights I give up of doing things and I'm like, oh, I, like I'm upset about it. I'm like, I'm never going to be happy. Like, is it worth it? Like questioning all that. But so I'm in school to be a therapist. So I'm working toward my master's in clinical psych and it's going to provide meaning one day. And I think that's a much better way to look at it. So thank you for that because <laughs> awesome. as I was writing a nice long research paper, I was really questioning life um, and the path <laughs> I was on. But it's so true that a lot of times we think we need to be super happy, cheery, and upbeat all the time. And I also think a lot of times people expect that out of us as well. So for mm -hmm. me, I tend to be a very bubbly, high energy person. And when that's not what people are seeing, they're like, well, what's wrong? You're not happy. Something's wrong. You're not okay. You're depressed, like going right down the rabbit hole. And like, I'm, I may be depressed. It's really great to check in with me. Love that they do that. However, mm -hmm. sometimes I'm just content in the moment. I'm focused on something else and I don't need to be, I don't have like that high energy in that moment, but it doesn't mean that I'm not happy. So I really yeah. love distinguishing it because happiness looks different at different times of the day for different people and different reasons. Like I'm happy and content with who I am, what I'm working toward, the work that I'm doing what I've accomplished, but I just may not be bubbly, high energy in the moment. That doesn't take away happiness. So I am so excited you brought that up because <laughs> it makes me feel so much better. Yeah. And isn't it funny because when you said, you know, in those moments when people encounter you and you're not your typical bubbly, happy, cheery self, they automatically question what is wrong with you? you is something not okay and this is also how we learn that being like that is not okay we internalize that don't we and that is again that toxic positivity and also that whole idea of invalidating your own feelings I shouldn't feel like this whereas it's completely normal to feel overwhelmed at times or feeling frustrated or whatever that might be so absolutely I think that's a brilliant example to show how we have those norms in society and how we also how that leads to us internalizing them yes and you know the other day I was really just overwhelmed like I said writing a research paper not my favorite thing to do um and I was falling apart like of stress like I was just at that point where like nothing was going to make me laugh I just needed to like breathe and I was talking to someone I was like I need to go pretend to be happy to record a podcast and like recording a podcast makes me happy I feel so good inside when I'm recording a podcast I love doing it but I was like I need to pretend to be happy as in I need to suddenly create this high energy bubbly personality so that people perceive me as happy when because I'm so passionate about it because I enjoy it I am happy. I hope that's what comes across. Maybe it doesn't. Yeah. I don't know. I think so. But it's so important to realize that I'm, that's like the thought I'm telling myself. I'm like, I have to pretend to be happy when no, I need to up, maybe up my energy a little bit and not come from like that stressed out point. But that's not like having a fake happiness. And that's exactly. Really it is so important because that's how you can help also break that stigma, you know, by showing that it's okay not to always be at your best and have the greatest day. You know, I think surely there is that level of professionalism we want to bring. You know, everyone knows that. It's like you record a podcast. Well, you probably want it to, you know, be at a certain standard and a certain level of professionalism just goes with that. But we have to find the line where professionalism turns into inauthenticity, I suppose, to some extent, you know, being untruthful or something like that. And I think you can still show up and say, look, it's not my greatest day. And that's okay. I'll just put that to the side at the moment or something like that. I think there's an opportunity in that to help break the stigma we have around that, you know? Yes, exactly. And that's what I love, like the how are you in the beginning, the how are you really? Mm. Like normalize that coming into the conversation. 
we may not all be coming from the best day ever. We might not have all mm. had the best week ever. And that's okay. It's okay for things mm. to be going on in our lives and to have different feelings for today, maybe yeah. to be good, but yesterday wasn't. Or maybe today was like a bad day for you. Maybe you experienced things you didn't enjoy that yeah. brought up a lot of emotions. All of that's okay and normal. But another yeah. thing I really love is connecting to others, to yourself and to the world because I know something that I learned in college that I'm not the world's biggest fan of is that you have to learn, then earn, then return. So you don't do anything for others until after you've earned it. And for me, I was like, no, I want to do things for others as I'm earning my place in this world. I want to combine that. But for so long, I was like convinced that that's not that's wrong to think that way to think that I can start with a nonprofit that I could start with volunteering and doing things and donating my time because I I love giving back I love being part of the community it makes me feel good when I know that I can make someone else feel good but there is a lot yeah. of messaging around that we need to take care of ourselves completely first before we can show up for anybody when a lot of times we can kind of do it together wow that is so interesting i have never in my life heard learn earn return um and i've always done some sort of volunteer work and even if it was just you know giving blood like donating blood or something like that when i was younger and probably was a little bit more clueless around what i could actually do um I have personally never heard that. I love that you question that and turned it around because we know one of the best things we can do actually for ourselves as well is to be kind to others and to support others in some way or form if we can, you know, if we have it in us and if we have the energy. I do not disagree with the statement of, you, you know, you can't pour from an empty cup. Sure, look after yourself first, because only then will you be able to look after others in a really, you know, honest and, and constructive way. But that doesn't mean that you have to complete your studies first and then earn a million dollars um, to start giving back. There are so many ways. And it also doesn't have, I mean, I admire what you're doing with this podcast love it but that might not be in everybody's strength or skill set or ambition or whatever it doesn't have to be that grand either you know it can be the simplest small acts um but identifying small acts of kindness you can do to give back in some way or form is one of the best things you can do not only for others and society but for yourself and research clearly shows this it really level raises our levels of happiness if we are kind to others yeah exactly and one of my favorite things to do is just like to say hi to people who may be walking alone by themselves and just mm. be like hi and once they're like face light up and someone spoke to them and that makes me feel good even if I'm feeling really upset and down seeing someone else's face light up lights up because I said something or did something tends to help me or during the pandemic I tried to spend a lot of time volunteering in whatever capacity I could that was safe and that was within my own means but finding small ways that maybe my mental health was struggling a lot at that time but what was stuff that I could do for myself that I also could do for others so for me that looked like coloring encouragement cards and sending them to the psych wards those positive Mm. affirmations that I was coloring and reframing these thoughts for myself telling myself that I'm enough and then giving it to others so they could have that messaging for me it was so important because I can tell myself I'm enough till I'm blue in the face like I really can but it makes such a big difference for me at least when I think of someone else receiving that message and I look at it from a different point of view someone who doesn't feel that way and they get that message and maybe it's the first time they're hearing it so I always love to combine it when I can and sometimes I can sometimes I'm like I'm done can't do anything for anyone today like I need a break and I love to honor that But I always love to find ways because I know for me, it's really helpful. I love I've always been like a huge into volunteering. My favorite things. I was like nine. So I always love to find ways that I can do that because it just it helps me help myself. That is so beautiful. That really touches me. And I think your example in the beginning was perfect, though, too. It can be as little as smiling at someone on the streets and saying hello, or even just smiling, even just noticing someone, you know, we have this loneliness pandemic around the world. And even just being noticed, being seen, I think makes a huge difference. 
there's so many people out there who feel lonely and like they have no one and you know being seen being greeted or having that a little bit longer chat at the checkout at the supermarket checkout or something like that can make such a big difference yeah it really as in so how's your day going mm. so surprising how many people that no one will ever ask that to like when yeah. i go to play tennis the lady at the front desk is always sitting there and i watch people just walk up and like i need to buy this i need to do this i need to pay for this lesson like that's the only interaction they don't like they're like playing on their phone like this not even like acknowledging the human yeah. being so yeah. i always love to just ask like how's your day going and like watch their face light up like someone's talking to me and acknowledging me as a person so yeah. important that we remember how seeing people allowing them to see us it really does yeah. help because sometimes yeah. like you also need someone to ask you how are you and you can even start that conversation. And I think a lot of people are waiting for someone else to start it with them. So knowing that mm. we can do it as well. Yeah, love it. Absolutely. I, first of all, I really just love the way that you're also shifting to flourishing because mm -hmm. with mental health, like you said, it's so easy to just see like mental health and it's like depression, anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia. And we're not looking at well-being. We're not looking at ways that we can cultivate it, not Every single person has a diagnosable mental health condition. That does not mean that they don't deserve to support their mental health. It doesn't mean they don't mm. deserve to feel good inside, to feel happy, yeah. to have good days and have meaning and purpose. So it's really important that we start shifting from this idea that mental health is only an illness to mental yeah. health is also how we feel. Mental well-being. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And be especially because... Everything that mental well-being or flourishing embodies, you know, whether it's, you know, that feeling of accomplishment, that feeling of being deeply engaged with life, feeling of, um, you know, living your purpose, whatever, they are all innate human needs. We do have those needs. And if we don't meet them, we will perceive a deficit. And that is when we start languishing. So we just assume as a blanket rule that if we don't do anything, we're okay. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that even for our bodies either. So I don't know why on earth we have this idea, I think, in society. It most certainly doesn't work for our minds. We need to be proactive and do something in order to be actually well. It's not our default state to thrive in life. Yeah, I mean, think about it. Like if you're going to go run a marathon, like you're not going to just like be able to all of a sudden run I don't even know how long that is I don't run yeah but, right? 42k <laughs> sounds like a lot so but you need yeah. to, you need to train you need to do things to get yourself there same with yeah. your mental health there are things you can do every day to get you further and further toward mental well-being whether or not you have a diagnosable mental health condition it doesn't have to be for the one i want to stress that so much because mm. like you said it really does a lot of times get associated with illness and yeah. we all can take proactive steps i mean if someone tells you to take a vitamin so that you don't have to mm. go to the doctor like i've been taking mm. vitamin c my entire life because people told me you don't have to go to the doctor if you <laughs> are taking vitamin c you won't get sick okay I will take my vitamin C. I'll even go and do my wellness checkup once a year. If you tell me that means I'm not going to have to go to the doctor all the time, love it. So if there's things that we can do for our mental well-being, why wouldn't we want to do it? Why aren't we having that conversation? Because for physical health, it's so second nature. Mm, exactly. Because otherwise it's like, you know, we, we know the importance, for example, of eating well. It's not just about getting calories into the body because our bodies need energy. Um, you know, we need to eat well because it's about way more than just calories. And in the same way, we need to do a lot more for our minds than just getting through a day, um, you know, in order to be well mentally. Absolutely. And there is so much we can do and it's all free or most of it is free. You know, you, you can find free version versions for everything, basically, you know, especially when it comes to mental well-being. Um, and it also doesn't have to be complex most of the things are really simple little things we can do in everyday life and and that's the important part too we need to do it on a regular basis just like we hopefully look after our bodies on a regular basis absolutely and on that note 
Can you give mm-hmm. advice to someone who's maybe listening and they're like, I want to start taking steps forward toward flourishing for my w- mm-hmm. mental well-being? What advice do you have? Yeah. So, I mean, if we dissect it again, mental well-being into those three parts, so where we have emotional well-being, where we say, you know, those moments of joy that carry us through the day or that hedonic happiness, I would say just plan. I love to talk about um, joy snacking. So plan small snacks of joy throughout the day, you know, just a couple, just so to brighten your day and give back some of the energy. That can be, of course, whatever feels good for you. It can be, it can mean taking your lunch outside rather than eating at your desk it can mean going for a small walk outside in nature it can mean just listening to your favorite song whatever that might be whatever gives you joy for a moment so that I think is a really neat little idea we can all do to brighten our days then the second component being psychological well-being there's actually lots of different elements to that so it's that that level of being deeply engaged of finding flow that level of accomplishment that level of finding purpose perceiving life as meaningful that's what that is about what is super important for that to be honest the foundation of that is understanding your own values and Fran you mentioned before how it given you back sold back your studies to you or something like that. can't remember exactly how you articulated it because you remembered how important it actually is for you. And therefore that makes it easier for those hard bits where you have to write research papers that you don't like and so forth, right? That is only possible because you understand what is really important to you, what your values are. You probably love the topic of psychology. You love the idea of helping other people be mentally well and overcome mental illness, right? Because you're obviously um, specializing in clinical psych. So that is only possible because you have a deep understanding of your values. And that is really the crux of it, understanding what is most important to you in life, and then looking of um, identifying small ways to put that into action. That would be my advice. If that sounds too complex and out there, because I know it can be, it's very intangible, um, but it's something a coach can help you work through. Then I would say, listen to your passions. Think back to your childhood. If you don't know what your passions are these days, what were you always passionate about? What do you love doing? And what do you do where you lose that sense of time? Um, you know, what do you, would you happy to struggle with, even though you knew you wouldn't succeed, for example, what do you love doing just for the sake of doing it? Chase that, do more of it, maybe try to get a little bit better at it that can give a deep sense of fulfillment and meaning as well. So understand your values, maybe chase your passions. So that's for that psychological well-being. And then for social well-being, I would say do what Fran does. Start noticing other people, smile at them, say hello, have a chat with them, ask people how they're really doing, and maybe think about how you might be able to contribute to society in even the tiniest shape or form. You are incredible that advice is amazing and it's all small steps that we really can take by listening to ourselves by making time for ourselves Mm -hmm. thank you so much for the work that you're doing for joining me today how can people connect with you and learn more people can connect with me via instagram at the flourishing dog they find me on linkedin facebook tiktok my website theflourishingdog.com i think if you want to find me you'll find me (laughs) Thank you so much for listening to Normalize the Conversation. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. This podcast is an initiative of Inspiring My Generation. Focusing on normalizing the conversation, bringing education and awareness to the forefront, and amplifying global voices to spark change and hope. Inspiring My Generation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization on a mission towards suicide prevention through awareness, conversation, education, and support. Connect with us on Instagram at inspiringmygeneration and visit our website inspiringmygeneration.org to learn more about our work and how you can make a difference.